Welcome to the Future Thinkers Podcast. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. And this podcast is all about the future. Hello, and welcome to episode number 30 of the Future Thinkers Podcast. This one, we're going to be interviewing Robin Hansen, the author of The Age of M. Age of M is about this small period of time that happens when humans figure out how to emulate the human brain. He talks about the economics, the science, the physics. He talks about a lot of different things in this book, and we are interviewing him today. So Robin is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. And his blog is overcomingbias.com. Before we get into this episode, I wanted to thank our recent donors and patrons for supporting our show and helping us make it better. Thank you, Connor, Martin, and Donald. Woohoo! And for the rest of you guys listening, if you want to help us by sending a small donation or becoming a patron, go to futurethinkers.org slash support to find out how you can do that. And for any notes from this episode or links to books or anything like that, go to futurethinkers.org slash episode 30. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. I read that you've been working on this book for quite some time. How did the original idea come about? Well, I wrote a paper on this in my first year of graduate school. So I started uh, my PhD program in social science in 1993. And my first Christmas vacation, I went home and tried to uh, apply the basic economic concepts that I'd been uh, learning to this unusual scenario. And I wrote a paper on that and I published it the next year in an obscure journal. And uh, then I mostly set it aside while I worked on other things for the next 20 years. Can you tell us a bit about your background? Uh, my background is excessively diverse for an academic. I uh, started out in uh, engineering in college. And I switched to physics. Then I went to graduate school in philosophy. And then I went back to physics and got a master's in philosophy and then a master's in physics. And then I did nine years of computer research and finally decided to try to take this hobby I had of institution design and turn it into a career. So I went back to school to get my PhD at Caltech. And then I did a postdoc in health policy. And then I finally got my tenure track position here at George Mason in 1999. Wow, that's pretty diverse. Yeah, very diverse. What drove all the different fields? Or what drove you to experiment in the different fields? Well, initially, I was just very uh, (laughs) self-centered. I was interested in studying what I was interested in studying. And and when I learned the basics of a field, uh, other fields started to get more interesting. And so for a while, I just kept Uh, studying whatever fields I had the biggest questions in. Uh, And then it took a long time before I finally realized that if I was going to try to make a career out of ideas, I have to uh, pay attention to the usual career ladder and collect the usual contacts and credentials. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a bit about the book? Sure. Uh, The book just out from Oxford is called The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life When Robots Rule the Earth. It's a lot like a science fiction novel, except there's no plot and no characters, and I'm trying to be really serious and careful about the setting. So I take a off-discussed scenario of technology that might appear called brain emulations. It's been around in science fiction and futurism for many, many decades. And I try to take it really seriously, and assuming that that technology shows up and is cheap, I try to analyze what, in fact, the world looks like after that. And I try to go into great detail. And so I filled almost 400 pages full of detail, applying everything I know in physics and computer science and economics and other social sciences and human sciences to fill out a detailed picture of what this would be like, applying our standard theories. Mm -hmm. What made you choose uh, to put economics at the center of all of it to kind of tie it all together? Well, um, there's a lot of what's called hard science fiction out there. Uh, where people try to take at least the technology seriously and try to get black holes right or starships right or uh, computer viruses right or things like that. Uh, But there's much less uh, where people try to get the social science right. Uh, Most people who are interested in tech futurism or science fiction uh, know a fair bit of hard technologies like computers or physics, and they don't really know much social science. What about the time scale of this this sort of universe you've created here, it's, I found that to be one of the more interesting things is it happens in a very tiny scale. So what is that scale? The scale is a roughly a year or two in ordinary clock time. Wow. We're talking about um, emulations of humans that can run at different speeds from human speeds. So in fact, I estimate the typical speed of an emulation in this society is roughly a thousand times 
human speed. So that means to the typical emulations, this era lasts a uh, thousand or two thousand years. Wow. So I've seen you describe why you arrived at this one thousandth of a human speed um, kind of average, but can you explain it to our listeners why you chose that particular number? Sure. So it's a trade off between uh, two factors, both of which uh, are discouraging or things that you want to avoid. One thing you want to avoid is learning a whole career and then very quickly having the world change and having your skills be irrelevant. What you'd like to do is learn a skill and how to do a job and then spend a whole subjective career, perhaps a century or more, uh, doing the job roughly the same way. And after that century or two, your mind probably becomes fragile and hard to learn new things and you have to be replaced by younger workers anyway. So uh, you might as well retire at that point. And so my best guess for how fast this economy grows is it, that it doubles roughly every month. And the doubling time of the economy is roughly a time scale on which jobs change, uh, tasks change and, and skills need to change. And so what the M's want to do is fit their career into that month. And so if it lasts a century, that means that they need to run roughly a thousand times human speed or faster in order to fit their career in the doubling time of the economy. So if they run much slower than a thousand times human speed, the jobs change uh, very quickly after they learn how to do the job. Uh, so that's a trade-off on one side. Of course, that means they could run anything faster than a thousand times and uh, they can run probably up to a million times or even faster human speed if they pay more because in order to run twice as fast, uh, you have to pay twice as much to build the hardware and pay for the energy and things like that. So that's on the one side. And the other side of the trade-off is, just like us, emulations gain uh, big economic advantages by concentrating into big, dense cities where they can then quickly interact with a great many other M's. But the speed of light is a limitation on how easily they can interact with other creatures how far away. So today, at the speeds we run, it turns out that our reaction time of a tenth of a second is enough time for light to move anywhere on Earth. And so we can be in virtual reality interacting with anyone on Earth and not really notice where they are if we had a good enough communication line. But as M's get faster, that distance uh, where they have to be you know, closer than a certain distance so that they don't notice where they are uh, gets smaller. And when it's a thousand times human speed, it's more like uh, 40 kilometers. And so if you get much faster than a thousand times human speed, then even if they have a, a city of, of tens of kilometers around full of M's, uh, they couldn't interact with most of them without at least noticing a delay, which would get in the way of their interaction. So they don't want to be that much faster than a thousand times human speed because otherwise that gets in the way of interacting with others in their city. This is one of the most fascinating aspects to me about this book is the time scale differences and how you said in one of your talks, if you're running as a slow emulation, sticking your hands into the pond of the fast emulation, you'll get bit. I love that. What is the motivation for M's to do work for normal meat space? Through most of human history, uh, through pretty much all of animal history, um, most people lived at subsistence level. That meant that uh, when they worked most of the time, uh, that gave them as enough income to survive and not that much more. Uh, that's how it's pretty much always been. Uh, if you weren't willing to work, you didn't exist uh, for very long. And so that's how it works in the emulation world, too. They, they live in a subsistence economy. In order to survive, they need to be working most of the time, and they need to be uh, in demand, i.e. they need to be one of the, the very best at whatever they do. Uh, if they are the best at what they do and they're willing to work most of the time, then they can earn barely enough to survive. If they choose not to, uh, then they don't exist. Uh, then somebody else does. So... In order for this scenario to work, all we need is some people willing to fill this role. Uh, it could be that the vast majority of humans, when they face the M world and somebody says, do you want to work really hard to, to, to make barely enough to exist? They say, no, I don't like that. Forget it. Uh, if the vast majority of humans say no, uh, it can still exist if you know a few dozen people say yes, because the key point is you can make billions of copies of any one of them. That is, uh, all it takes is a few really capable, willing people, and they can fill this entire emulation economy with copies of themselves. So what happens when the cost of technology becomes cheaper and cheaper, and eventually, you know, if we have solar power and 
transistors that are really efficient and it costs very little to run these M's, why would they want to be spending most of their time working if they can only just work, you know, maybe a few hours a week to fulfill their energy needs? Why would they want to do anything? So this is the a standard economic analysis of the supply and demand for labor. And on a key assumption, which some people have questioned, is the downward sloping uh, demand for labor. That is, uh, when there's only a limited number of smart humans around, uh, they're very valuable. Uh, they're worth a lot. But as you increase the quantity of them uh, and make more and more of them, uh, this downward sloping demand for labor says uh, that our value for the marginal worker uh, goes down. Uh, we use them in the most valuable uses first, and then as the supply goes up, as the quantity available goes up, uh, we allocate them to less and less useful tasks. And eventually there are just so many of them, so cheap and available, that you allocate them to uh, really quite low value tasks, but still, if the value of the task is higher than the cost, you still go there. The key assumption here is that labor demand curves slope down and they keep going down to very low wages. Uh, that is, when we have six billion humans, each one is very valuable. But when we have trillions of them and we don't in proportion expand all of the other things we have in society, like roads and buildings and machines, etc., then uh, having an enormous number of workers uh, with very limited other inputs means those workers on the margin are just not worth that much. It, it interests me that you've kind of gone through with this being one of the the sort of assumptions here that we would never have an emulated socialist economy. So is that some sort of an impossibility in your mind? I'm an economist, and so I'm using the standard economic tools to make the usual standard economic assumptions. So I want to distinguish what the usual standard assumptions are from what we as economists conclude. Our standard first cut analysis in almost everything is supply and demand. That is, we assume because it's relatively easy and it's not that bad an approximation often, that there's a lot of potential suppliers, a lot of potential buyers, and they each don't think they can influence the overall price that much. And their costs are relatively uh, local in the sense that uh, they don't need huge organizations to supply everything that, that takes over the entire market. And so supply and demand is our usual first cut analysis. And supply and demand implicitly assumes that suppliers and demanders own the things they can sell and that they sell them for something like money so that they can then buy other things that they want. So it assumes a, a market economy and it assumes relatively low regulation in the sense that uh, people can sell at whatever prices they choose. That is the standard assumption, and it's what we do to analyze most everything as a first cut. Now, it's not to say that we should not ever have regulation or that there are not substantial deviations sometimes from supply and demand. After you've taken your first semester of economics, you will hear in great detail if you go on to all of the you know complicated details that we go into in terms of uh, how there could be less than perfect competition in many ways and uh, many kinds of market failures, as we call them, and many potential regulations and many potential ways that you have as alternative production. And so all of that is, is possible and can be applied to the scenario I'm talking about. But, you know, I am doing the first cut, which is supply and demand. But I would say uh, we have a lot of literature on if you want to regulate something, what it takes and what the problems are. If there could be a free market in something, but instead you're going to uh, regulate that market, then you have to worry about black markets, for example. Can you prevent people from buying and selling? How well can you monitor their buying and selling? You know, how much can you control the production? Is, is it something that millions of people can each separately produce? Or is there a big central factory where you can go in and put soldiers around the factory and say, we've taken this over and now it has to be done our way? You have to think about those things if you want to think about uh, regulating. Now, in general, regulation has a limited ability to change what would otherwise be the market outcome. If free drugs would be uh, relatively cheap and you regulate and prohibit drugs, you can definitely raise the price of drugs, but you can't necessarily raise it arbitrarily. The higher you raise the price of drugs relative to what the free market price of drugs would be, the more that people create black markets to evade your regulation, and the harder it gets to uh, find all those black markets and squelch them uh, if there's really a huge demand for the product you're selling and, and the cost is actually relatively low. This world I'm describing of M's is so very far from the world we live in that even a highly regulated version of it would still be pretty far from the world we live in. Uh, so you could take this world of M's and imagine whatever the wages are. And now imagine we 
restrict the supply of M's and regulate their wages so drastically that wages become 10 times what they otherwise would be. That's a pretty you know, dramatic degree of regulation. You would really need global regulation. It would have to be quite intrusive to monitor everyone and make sure they aren't violating your rules in order to make the wages go up to 10 times what they otherwise would be. That could still be conceivable though, but even that is a world that's really different from our world and isn't that different from the world I'm describing in this book. So that's the key point is, if you want just a first cut idea of what the world looks like, that's very different from our world, supply and demand is a, is a decent first cut. So then with regulation or other uh, forms of uh, you know, government production or whatever, you could move modestly away from that, but you can't move it all the way back to where we are. And what if we go in the other extreme and we have no regulation at all? And these emulations are able to innovate extremely fast if they have the processing power and they're able to maybe mine asteroids or go out into space so they don't necessarily have to participate in a job economy. I mean, they're still doing things and they're able to fulfill their energy needs. So do you see that as a possibility? So a low regulation uh, M economy would probably grow faster. That is, it would uh, more quickly innovate, as you say, more quickly uh, move into new territories, both physically and in product spaces. Uh, a fast growing, uh, innovative economy could uh, you know, more quickly change and become something different. But the key point is, uh, how fast can the population grow? So as long as the population of M's can grow very quickly and can grow faster than the economy can grow, still the wealth per M must fall. And, and this has been the case for pretty much all of history again. Pretty much all of history, we've had growth. Uh, the number of humans grew and then humans developed new technology, et cetera. It was a slow growth in the past, but it was still slower in the past than we could grow populations. So uh, whenever we invented new things, most of that new wealth that we created went into new population, went into having more of us. And it was only in the last few hundred years that we've been able to grow wealth so fast that it's been faster than the rate at which we can grow people so that the wealth per person has been increasing. So the trend toward increasing wealth is a very robust trend. We should expect that in the future. But the fact that we can grow wealth faster than population, that's more a temporary effect of the fact we just haven't had good population technology for a while. The, the technology by which we grow more people hasn't changed much in a very long time, whereas all the technology by which we create wealth has been changing enormously. The world of M's is a world where the technology of changing population suddenly changes. That is, you are suddenly able to make far more substitutes for people very fast in factories. I'm interested to know from the side of the emulation, perhaps the artificial intelligence side, like what makes you believe the brain is something that could actually be emulated in the future? Well, as I mentioned, I started out in physics long ago, and physicists have a totalitarian view of how physics explains the world, really. Physics just isn't a set of theories for an obscure set of odd processes you could do in the lab. Physics is a theory of everything around us. And uh, we have been quite successful, really, in understanding everything around us, everything in your office, everything at your home, <laughs> everything you've ever seen, really, in terms of a, of a standard set of physical theories explaining what they're made out of and how those parts work. I buy that. I think they're right. Physics does explain the world we see. Now, there are some strange particles that you can make, strange things that happen very far away that physicists are still puzzling over. But the actual world around you, we've nailed that. We, we pretty much know how that works. That includes not just your cars and your food. That includes you, uh, your body. Uh, we've looked inside your bodies and we've seen the parts and what they're made of. And that's the same parts as everywhere else. And we've looked inside your brain. And we've seen that your brain is made out of exactly the same sort of parts as everything else, interacting in the same sort of ways. And we think we understand uh, how those parts work at the low level and, and how they interact and what they're made out of. And so your brain is a complicated arrangement of those things. And the hard part in understanding your brain is understanding all that complexity. But the parts we do understand. So can we emulate a brain comes down to can we figure out uh, how parts work well enough to emulate them. So the traditional artificial intelligence approach is to sort of watch what people do and uh, create a mental theory in our minds of how that works and then write code that expresses that theory and see if we can capture their behavior. The brain emulation approach is different in the sense that 
it's trying to port the software that's in the brain. So what we try to do is we make computer models of how each type of cell in the brain works in terms of taking signals in, changing your internal state, and sending signals out. So if we can figure out how individual cells work in terms of uh, signal processing, and we have a good enough scan of a whole brain in terms of uh, where all the cells are and what type they are and who's connected to what, then we should be able to have a good enough model of the whole brain. Uh, assuming, of course, physics is right. That is, uh, your brain really is <laughs> made out of these cells and they really do interact through standard physics. Yeah, I, I think it's actually brave in the assumptions you've made to write this book. I think it leaves you open for criticism, but it's entirely necessary to kind of create any vision of the future. Um, you said, well, we need to envision more possibilities of the future. So why do you think we need more like versions of Star Trek and that sort of thing? Well, you know, there's lots of interesting things to study in the world, but we have a huge field of history, uh, which, you know, has many thousands of researchers, uh, many thousands of books. Actually, if you look on Amazon.com for keywords, 20% uh, of the books have a keyword history. So we have enormous studies of history. Uh, and of course, plausibly history is important and interesting to study. But the future is also important, plausibly more important, because we can actually do something about the future. The past is too late to do anything about. So plausibly, we should study the future even more than we studied the past. But in fact, there are very few people who are studying the future. And honestly, an awful lot of what goes under the name of future studies is more wishful thinking and inspirational speeches and that sort of thing. And advocacy for values uh, indirectly using the future as, as a way to talk uh, really about today, which are all fine things for people to do, but they mean that in fact, there's even less just trying to think about the future seriously uh, in the way academics think seriously about the past. Yeah, there seems to be a big tendency to latch on to whatever world model works for whatever individuals studied in a narrow field. So it's, it's interesting that you've combined so many fields and thought so deeply about this. So I'm interested to hear actually more about the virtual reality world that you've imagined. So emulations are running on computers. And the cost of running an emulation brain is actually pretty large compared to today's cost. But the idea is that eventually that's a low cost. But the cost to create a virtual reality for someone like us is already pretty low. People already, you know, live in, vir you know, experience virtual reality worlds and video games. And they can tell they aren't real, of course, but they are real enough that they can be productive and they can interact and work in. Uh, since the emulations are on computers, it's straightforward to put them in a virtual reality. They don't need to get dizzy or anything like that. You can just have a perfect connection there between their brains and the virtual reality world. And so it seems like it would make complete sense to put them in virtual reality when they don't need to interact with the virtual world. Now, most jobs in our economy are desk jobs, and so most jobs in the M economy are plausibly desk jobs. So that means uh, there'd be little point in giving them you know, artificial desks to work at. Might as well put them in a virtual reality and have them see a spectacularly luxurious office environment. Because in virtual reality, it's cheap to make something luxurious and beautiful. It doesn't really cost any more than it does to make it ugly and grimy. Uh, and so they might as well. Work under the sea today, work on Mars tomorrow. Right. Now, uh, they are working most of the time. Uh, that is a key element of this economy. So when they're working, the virtual reality can be beautiful, but it needs to not be too distracting. And so that's a reason why it wouldn't really be that dramatic if you were to see it. It would be pleasant, it would be nice, it would be comfortable. You know, when you first saw it, you might be amazed and stare at it for a while, but it would be the sort of thing that after a while you could not stare at. <laughs> you would be okay with not paying attention to it. It would be in the background and you could focus on your work. Now, when you got off work and, and wanted to do something in leisure, then of course, uh, virtual reality could be a lot more, you know, dramatic and demanding and, and, and just make you stare at it and make you pay attention to it because it was so interesting. Uh, that would be fine during leisure times, but that's not so good at work. I wanted to uh, move into a little bit of the social aspects of the emulation world. It seems that a lot of the human interaction is based on drives for mating and social acceptance, which is essentially, you know, the more social acceptance you have, the more likely you are to have food in a tribal society, and the more likely you are to have better selection of mates. So other than some sort of work transactions, what would be the reason for M's to have these interactions with each other and to have any kind of a social identity or want to be perceived a certain way? Emulations are psychologically very human. 
this is the key point. So we, we take a human brain and we create an emulation of it and then we put it on a computer. But when we turn it on, you have to convince it that it's on the computer because the last thing it remembered, it was a ordinary human. So psychologically, it's very human. So uh, that's why it's possible to think about the age of M and to think about all the details of it because we can take humans as we they are and, and use those sorts of psychological tendencies to think about how the M's would behave. So they will choose to exist and have friends and lovers and all those things for the same reasons we do. And of course, we're not always that aware of why we do them. But as you say, we have these robust patterns that we've seen that, that people do want to have lovers, they want to have friends, they want to have respect. Uh, and so uh, they do things to gain these things and emulations would do that too. The key is that the world changes somewhat. So starting with lovers say, you know, humans have a very deeply ingrained desire for you know, attention, respect, sex, pair bonding, and M's would have that too. They might reduce it somewhat through the analogy of castration or something, but most likely uh, it's still pretty deep and they still want it. Now, in our world, uh, reproduction has been tied to sex. And so uh, even though we enjoy sex and we have a lot of sort of desires about it that have little to do directly with reproduction, that's the origin of it. And so traditional societies have regulated and tried to control sex exactly because uh, it was tied to reproduction and reproduction was a key element of the society. For emulations, uh, sex isn't tied to reproduction anymore. That is, they reproduce by making copies and not via sex. So sex loses its central place in how things are done in society and, and therefore there's less of a need to regulate it. Uh, the emulation world doesn't need to control it and make sure uh, you know things don't go wrong too much because reproduction is done other ways. The other sorts of reproduction, they probably would have more controls over and more moral senses and more rules and things like that over uh, just how they reproduce, but sex itself would not. Uh, similarly, you know, we like to have friends and presumably emulations have friends. Humans are very social and uh, that's one of the key elements of, of human nature is that, you know, our distant ancestors had these large social groups and we had intricate politics and, and social relations in these large groups. And that's carried over, of course, through all the eras we've seen. Uh, farmers have complicated and intricate social relations and so do we in the industrial era, so M's would probably do that too. In modern workplaces, politics is essential for most workers. That is, whatever your job officially is, one of your sub-jobs is to socialize with your coworkers and your boss and, and others out there to gossip and find out what people are saying and try to you know, help your allies and diss your rivals. <laughs> Our human political nature is uh, on full display in most office places, and uh, people who just keep their head down and ignore office politics often lose big <laughs> because uh, they lose out in the office politics to others who uh, manage to make it work for them. So most likely emulations will need to be political too. They can't just you know ignore people. Uh, they will need to create friends and alliances and uh, gossip and find out what people think of them and if uh, you know say nice things about their allies and diss their rivals, change their alliances as necessary in order to stay on top of uh, local politics. Those are things that humans have done all through history and M's would probably continue. So right there is a functional reason M's need to be social because uh, otherwise they get ignored. I think it's fascinating uh, the direction you've gone with the copying of individual M's and I think some of the opportunities to develop as an individual would be really multiplied from that getting to see yourself like you know anytime you see a picture of yourself or a video of yourself and you kind of like pick up on something you're doing unconsciously or you weren't aware of but in this world, you get to actually watch copies of yourself behave and interact in the real world. And if, like you said somewhere in the book too, you wouldn't have to speculate anymore how your life would be different if you had made a different decision because you'd be able to watch an M do exactly that. Do you see other ones like that? What happens when there's other copies of you out there and how you feel toward them has been one of the hardest things to try to envision in the scenario. That's one of the th things that's farthest away from our current experience. So I've struggled with that and tried to come at it from a number of different angles and done the best I can, but I'll say that still I probably didn't get it that right. Uh, but one of the things we can be sure of is, yeah, there'll be a lot more versions of you around that uh, are just a bit different from you, but still pretty much you. That is, uh, they, they were you as a child, they went through the same training, and then at some point uh, there was a divergence. They studied for a different career, they moved to a different city, they had a different spouse, 
or even more recent versions, they, they were trained for the same job, even do the same sort of equipment, but now there's a copy of them uh, a few miles away in a slightly different context. And they're all around available for you to learn from if you want. Now, you might get too discouraged by paying it not attention to them because you might not feel unique as much anymore and that the world cares as much about you because, hey, there's these other versions of you around. But honestly, uh, people are able to ignore that in our world. I mean, we aren't really that different from each other in our world, but we manage to feel unique anyway. But yeah, you could learn about what happens with you know other copies of you who have the same spouse. <laughs> what do they do and what? how does that work? Uh, other people with the same job, uh, other people with the same allies or different allies, same hobbies. Uh, you could get statistics from these other versions of you who uh, live pretty similar lives and also older versions of you. You could see what someone a lot like you is like five years later because they're right there to look at. Do you think that the M's would be able to see their own programming and alter it? Well, in principle, today in software, we have a phenomena called software rot. This is a phenomena whereby uh, when systems uh, get old, they uh, are been spent a long time adapting them to particular circumstances and adding new modules and changing features, etc. In that process of changing and adapting to circumstances, they often just become very hard to change. Now, with software, you can go in and look at any one line and you can type in new characters and change that line. It's not that you can't change any part. It's that you don't know how to change it usefully. The older the software gets, the more ties there are. We, we often call it spaghetti code. The more that different parts just get tied together and more you try to change any one thing, the more other things you'd have to change in order to make that first change work. And eventually, it just gets a big pile of spaghetti code that's very hard to change. And today, what we do is we just throw it away and we start over from scratch. Uh, that's what we do when code gets too old and fragile like that. The code that's in your brain is pre-existing spaghetti code that evolution put together and it didn't document it and it didn't try to sort of make it understandable to you and so it's pretty hard to understand so the first cut assumption is that when we first are able to make emulations we just don't understand this code and mostly we can't change it now we'll just try turning some knobs and we'll f probably find a few hundred or even thousand like little things we can change that make some sort of difference and that'll give us a menu of different ways we can change you <laughs> to make you more focused or more optimistic or whatever else we want to do but that'll be a limited menu of changes and beyond that it'll just be this opaque mess that we don't understand how to change initially eventually of course we'll figure it out and then eventually we'll be able to make more substantial changes but plausibly there's a era before that i can talk about and my book is focused on this early M era when we don't know how to make these changes. Because once we do know how to make these changes, it's just much harder to predict what happens. Because until we know what the actual changes are, i.e. what the modules are and how you break them down and what parts can work by themselves without other parts, uh, it's hard to say very much about what we would do with that ability to change minds. But it goes to say within with that ability to shrink time and, and live out 10 years in the span of a you know, a couple of days or whatever, that the, those solutions would come nearly instantly. Well, I'd say the right metric to be using is doubling times of the economy. So our era and over the last few hundred years, the economy has been doubling lately every 15 years. During the farming era, it doubled every thousand years. During the forager, era, it doubled every quarter million years. But each of these eras has actually seen a similar number of doublings so far. So that's plausibly they've seen a similar amount of change, uh, even though the time scales are vastly different. And also plausibly during this M era, we also see a similar number of doublings. So I'd say, however fast you think would change, would be changing now, scale that in terms of doublings. How many doublings will it take to make some change? And then as the M era speeds up, you should think in terms of, well, because the doublings are coming faster, change is coming faster. That's a good first approximation. Now, actually, in the M era, growth will more happen because of a just a raw increase in the amount of physical capital as opposed to innovation, uh, whereas in the past eras, most change has been due to innovation. So that says that the amount of innovation per doubling is a bit less in the M era than it's been, but still within a factor of two or so, it's about the same. Can you explain why that is, the less innovation? During previous eras, we've just always had some input that's been limited where we just couldn't expand it so in our era it's been people that is we can make machines really fast we've got plenty of real estate and plenty of raw materials 
but we just can't expand people. And so there's what called diminishing returns to expanding everything except one key input. You really want to expand everything together and then you can double everything. So if you doubled, if you have, took a world like ours and you made an entire another planet like ours, exactly the same, then that planet could, of course, produce everything that we produce. And then together, the two planets could be twice as much as one planet. But if you just double all the machines on Earth without doubling the people or doubling the land or things like that, you don't double the output because you're missing some of the key inputs. And so uh, during our era, our growth uh, has been limited because we can't grow people very fast. That's what's been forcing us to grow innovation. Now, during the farming era, they could grow people as fast as they wanted, and they could even grow animals as fast as they wanted, but they couldn't really grow land as fast as they wanted. So land to use was a limited resource. And so in order to be able to use land more efficiently, they, they had to innovate. That was partly what limited the, the, the farming economy from growing. So the emulation economy, plausibly, at least for a while, it can grow the machines really fast. It can grow the substitutes for people, i.e. the emulations very fast. And for a while, it's just not limited in terms of raw materials or real estate. There's plenty of that around. And so for at least many doublings, it can just grow by just making more things in factories. Now, making and using things does cause innovation. It's called learning by doing. So plausibly, there'll still be a lot of innovation. Uh, it'll just be less as a fraction because now we have this new way to grow that we haven't had until recently or, or even now, uh, which is just cranking more stuff out of factories. It's interesting to think about innovation as just another factor in all of this. That's, I've never really thought about that before, actually. I wanted to ask you about the experience of M's, how they perceive themselves. If they're based on a human, they will probably be pretty close to how humans experience themselves, at least at first, at least until they're able to edit their own code. So where do you see it going? Like, what's the vector here in terms of their personal experience as this system evolves? Just in terms of how they compare to us, when we look backward to our ancestors, we tend to highlight the commonalities. But I think if our ancestors were looking forward to us, they would see the differences. We don't really have any other ancestors as choices, so we feel pretty obligated to pick our ancestors and identify with them. But when you look forward, you can imagine different kind of descendants or even descendants who don't change. And therefore, you're less primed to just accept whatever descendants you have as like you. So I think emulation, similarly, where they will look back at us and focus on the similarities. They will see, yes, they have changed in some ways, but they will see how many different ways they have not changed, how they are still in common. Just like we look back on our farming ancestors or our foraging ancestors, and we see how they are very like us in many ways, and we identify with them. But honestly, if they looked forward to us, if, if you could take a you know subsistence forager, who's there are still few of them out there in the margins of our world, and you show them our world and us, they will not so much see us as an obvious continuation of themselves, they will more see us as aliens or strangers. I mean, we are weird. We are we are different. So we looking forward to emulations, we see them more as different because we don't see it that we had to become emulations. We can imagine we might not change. So we imagine the emulations as being different. And so I think that explains part of uh, the different attitudes. So I have been describing, and the book describes more many features of emulations, and some of them are familiar, and some of them are strange. And so I think you and most readers probably are not sure how much you want to identify with them, how much you want to think of them as the same species or as some sort of an alien. But I'm pretty sure that when they look back to you, they will see the commonalities. Now, even if they're seeing the commonalities, though, that doesn't mean they think they're equal to you. So Honestly, if you look inside your own heart at how you think about your ancestors, you feel better than them. <laughs> you think you're superior to your ancestors. Now, maybe you don't blame them for learning what they were taught. Uh, they did the best they could given their world, but you think you're better. You think your ways are better. You think your attitudes are better. Your, your technology is better. Your society is better. And emulations will think that way about you too. They, they will look back on humans uh, with perhaps some gratitude, some nostalgia, some sense of origins, but they will think they're better. And there's a lot of ways in which they'll be right. They are better. What kind of variables do you see that need to happen between now and the period that the emulations begin and your book begins? What are some of the more important thing, key innovations or things that need to happen in that period? 
there's three t- key technologies that are required to create emulations. Uh, all of them are on trends to plausibly be ready within roughly a century, but none of them are close to being ready. One thing we need is lots of cheap, fast parallel computers. There are standard trends, and on those trends, plausibly, uh, well within a century, uh, we'll have enough of those, but they're not ready yet. Another is we need high enough resolution, cheap, fast brain scans. Initially, these will be destructive. You take a brain that's been uh, frozen in some way, fixed, and then you slowly slice off a layer. You scan the next layer and find spatial and chemical detail to see exactly what's where. You record that all in a big database, and uh, that's the scan. Uh, We actually have decent scans. So we've done, for example, a mouse brain at a remarkable resolution. Uh, It's not a good enough chemical or spatial resolution quite yet, but it's still pretty good. A human brain is a thousand times bigger than a mouse brain, so we still have a ways to go there, but we're on track of getting there in a few decades. Uh, The third thing we need that's somewhat harder to predict is computer models of all the types of cells in the brain. Now, we don't even know how many types of cells there are there, really. We have some decent models for a few types. Uh, People have made models in their computer, and they've compared that to how these cells seem to work in, in the lab. And it looks like for at least some of the cell types, we know roughly how to model them. But we got to do it for all the different cells in the brain, and that'll take a while. So the computer industry is on the first track is in a huge industry, and there's just not much we can do to influence that. The scanning industry is actually uh, pretty small, so you could accelerate that if you put in more effort. But honestly, it's probably the thing that will be ready first, so there's not so much point. The third input, which is the cell models, is the thing that it's a part of academia where people do these cell models, but it's still pretty small. Uh, We could put a lot more work into that, and then that could speed up. Uh, And that could make a substantial difference, depending on, of course, how hard that job turns out to be. We don't really know. And the basic thing about modeling is you don't really know how close you are to having a good model until you have a good model. When the models are not good enough, you just don't really know how far away you are. So um, one big industry and two academic research areas, uh, all three have to progress to uh, sufficient levels before M's are possible. They're still a long way away, probably far enough away that it isn't worth any business venture trying to uh, start it up now. But at some point, say within 10 years before this is feasible, it will be worth making a business venture. And at that point, people will spend billions of dollars to try to pursue this because you can make trillions of dollars (laughs) by being one of the first uh, to be able to feel this technology. Mm -hmm. Being an M farmer. (laughs) So how has this studying these subjects and writing this book changed how you plan for the future and your personal life? How have they affected that? I'm not sure it's changed my life that much. Again, I wrote this first paper back in 1993 and some of the main policy implications were just obvious then. One of that being, uh, people need to diversify their assets so that they own something other than their ability to earn wages. That is the main recommendation for most anyone trying to survive this sort of transition. Plausibly, it doesn't happen for a while, but when it does happen, it may happen relatively suddenly. So trying to wait until you hear about it and then doing something may be a mistake. It may be just wiser just to set something up and then not have to deal with it for yourself, for your children, grandchildren, just be in the habit of being ready for it. But that was obvious decades ago. If you want to succeed in this world, which is a high bar because uh, most emulations are going to be copies of the few hundred best humans. And so if you want to be one of those few hundred best humans, uh, you want to think about what does that take? Uh, I had some initial ideas again uh, 20 years ago, but I think more recently I, I do understand better what the demand will be for. And honestly, very quickly, the demand moves from the most productive in the human economy to humans who are just very capable and young and flexible and have the potential to learn how to be the best in the emulation economy. And because this is likely to be based on destructive scaling initially, we have the scenario that early in the emulation world, the emulation economy starts to approach human parents with promising young children and saying, could we please destructively scan your child so that we can turn them into an M because they have the potential of being a successful M in our new world. Wow. So that's a pretty dramatic conflict. So you should think about your position on that and be ready for it. 
because probably most of the successful M's will be those descendants of these children who were scanned in early and then turned out to be uh, well adapted and uh, well suited for the simulation world. Yeah, the ethics of all of this is a whole other ball game. <laughs> right, and ethics is awkward because most societies, uh, the ethics has adapted somewhat to their circumstances. That is, uh, our ethics in our society is somewhat dependent on the world we live in, and it's different from the ethics that our ancestors had in their societies. That makes some sense, but then it makes it harder for us to think about the ethics of a different society from ours. We can say, well, by our ethics, uh, what they might do uh, is something we disapprove of, but of course, they might change what they approve of, and they might think it's okay. So in my book, I've tried to mainly focus on what I think they will think rather than what I think about whether what they're doing is right or wrong. And uh, that seems the right sort of thing to do for the purpose of my book, which is just to describe this era as faithfully as I can. It's much easier for me to present myself as an expert on the positive consequences, i.e. what's likely to happen if uh, we did little, than it is as an expert on what should happen. Uh, it's much harder to be an expert on what should happen. And uh, I may have opinions about that, but I don't want to confuse readers and uh, listeners with thinking that that's the expertise I'm presenting. Uh, so I want to separate and distinguish that. So emulations probably, for example, will be more okay with what we might think of as dying. So for us, death is, is a terrible, huge cost, and it's a terrible moral outrage. And so we are greatly offended by uh, anyone who would not only kill someone else, but even kill themselves. Uh, we're not that comfortable with suicide. Emulations, though, uh, they'll have huge financial and other incentives to be used to a sort of easy come, easy go. For an emulation who lasts a whole workday, they um, may work for 8 to 12 hours, and then they need to rest for 12 to 16 hours before they're ready to work again. So that means only a half to a third of their day time is spent working. But at the beginning of the workday, when they're ready and raring to go, they could make a lot of copies of that version of themselves. And then those copies can work for a few hours. And then if you end that copy and then erase it, for that copy, pretty much all of it was spent working. And so it's a factor of two to three more efficient in terms of productivity. Now, it doesn't remember or learn as much from that day's work. Uh, so when learning is important, uh, then you don't want to do that so much. On the other hand, it doesn't get older and more fragile with that experience either. And so I think and predict M's will mostly be okay with quite often splitting off many copies at the beginning of the workday and having very few of those copies continue on to the next workday. Uh, they might be erased or perhaps retire to a much slower speed. For many people in our world, that sounds like a horror. That sounds like a violation of their moral rules and something they wouldn't possibly tolerate and, and would never want to go in for. But I predict that emulations will be okay with it. For them, it's not a big deal. Uh, they will have tried it out many times before. It seems like it works okay, and they'll just be doing it. I suppose when it becomes commonplace, it's not going to be so much of a big deal anymore. Yeah, and if you can back up all the experiences and the data from their day and just feed it into the main copy that goes on, then maybe there's not just not a big deal. Right. Well, if you could merge the copies, so you merged all of their experiences and memories, uh, there would be much less of a conflict. However, I think during the emulation era, it just won't be possible to merge in that way. What would be possible is at the end of the workday, you could just report back each of these copies could go to back to the original and say, hey, this is what I did today. This is what I learned. Uh, this is things to watch out for. They should give a summary report. They could even have recorded the whole day on video or they could write a summary up. They, they can be archived so they're available if, if there's ever an issue. If two weeks later you go back, well, what happened with that client? What, what did I do then? You could go back to that archive or revive it and ask it uh, what happened. More detail. <laughs> but still, you wouldn't be fully merging their memory as if you had done it yourself. You could totally imagine a narcissist having a relationship with himself and, or herself, <laughs> <laughs> being this whole like circle of friends and relationships and stuff. Now, I actually expect that there'll be somewhat of a um, disapproval of people who are too into themselves. So you can imagine like a whole city of George's <laughs> where George does all the jobs in the city of George and George has lots of relationships with himself of many sorts. And, you know, it's all about George. And I expect other M's would find that a little creepy. <laughs> and in most work groups, there'd be only just one copy of any one person like George or Tim or Sally. Uh, and 
you would know there are these other versions of yourself out there, but you wouldn't actually interact that much with them most of the time. You would be more in a familiar interaction with other people who look and act different than you. But you could, as you needed and wanted, go visit and, and talk to these other copies of yourself because you trust them more than you trust other people. And, and they are a unit then of training and finance and, and law and politics that uh, that you're allied with. What starts to get blurry near the end of this book where you, you're not predicting so much anymore or feel it's it's it gets too hard to predict? Well, the book is ordered in terms of uh, kinds of disciplines. So I start with uh, physics and computer science, and uh, then I move on to uh, basic economics, then I move on to organizations and sociology and psychology. In terms of that order, I'm moving more away from fields that I have a strong education in toward other fields that I have to brush up more quickly and perhaps just less understand the fundamentals of. I'm also moving from fields where we have really solid, deep theories to, to fields where uh, we just have a large patchwork of overlapping theories, none of which we rely on that heavily. And so that's also you know, places where it's harder to draw conclusions. The, the deeper the theory, the more you can extend that theory well outside of the range of data you had to support it. So there's more worry when we have these patchwork of little theories that they're more tied to the context of the world that we live in now and wouldn't work in this next world. And of course, at the end of the book, I'm also talking about uh, the harder problems of like, how do you evaluate all this? Uh, what other variations might be possible? Where have I gone wrong? <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, how should you try to survive and, and succeed in this world? And those are just harder questions, but I figured I shouldn't ignore them. Before we finish up this interview, I wanted to throw a curveball. Since in this early emulation era, the emulations would act very similar to humans, they would feel very similar to humans, they might not be aware of their code, they might not even realize that they're in a virtual reality. So recently there's been a lot of key scientists coming up with the idea that the simulation hypothesis is actually very likely that by certain calculations it's quite probable that we are currently living in a virtual reality. So what's your view on that? I actually have a paper uh from very early on, when the very first uh, paper by Nick Bostrom came and got a lot of press uh, about the hypothesis, I immediately wrote something at the time about how to live in a simulation. That is, assuming that there is a simulation, uh, how should that change your actions? Somewhat remarkably to me, there's very little interest over the years in that question, uh, what to do different. There's enormous interest in could it happen and is it true? And I think that's analogous to the emulation era book in the sense that for many decades, people have talked about, are emulations possible? And if they were possible, when would they happen? And would they be conscious? And would they be me? And there's been almost no attention to, yes, but what would the world actually be like? And again, in the same way for simulations, there's very little attention to, yes, but okay, if, if you're in a simulation, how should you act different? What is your world like in that sense? So I think it's an interesting hypothesis. I, I think on net, I, I, it's hard for me to really believe that the future is going to be that interested in making simulations of us. So I, I have to get a, a mildly low probability that I am in a simulation, or you are, but uh, it's not zero. And so I certainly think it's something to consider. But people, I think, are way too quick to assume that it doesn't matter. That is, you should still do exactly what you do before, regardless of whether you're in a simulation. I think that's just wrong. The key point is that most simulations are not global simulations of the entire universe. Most simulations we've ever made, and probably will make, are affected by the cost of a simulation. The bigger and wider the scope of a simulation, the more it costs to run it. The longer it lasts in time and the more people that are involved and the more the universe is involved in the simulation, the more expensive it is to run that simulation. And assuming that our descendants have any remotely you know, similar costs we do, they will then be more willing to run small simulations than big ones. And so the first implication is that if you're in a simulation, you're probably in a small one. What does that mean? That means uh, there's not much point in saving for retirement. You'll never retire. Uh, there's not much point in sending donations to Africa. Africa doesn't exist. You know, this larger world you think you're in, it's mostly not that big a world. The small world around you really is the real world and the rest of it is illusory. Uh, so that means you should pay attention to the smaller world and focus on it. There's also probably a reason for the simulation. You may not be it. It might be some key pivotal event that you're near or a key pivotal person that you're nearby or interesting person. And the simulation will probably focus on that pivotal event or person. And then uh, to the extent that you move away from that pivotal event or person, uh, you might be dropped from the simulation. 
So uh, you should think around you and ask, what are these plausible pivotal people or events that you could be here because they are here and try to stay near them? <laughs> <laughs> Move as close as possible to Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> know him and he's a plausible reason the simulation can be run then yeah uh, don't lose touch <laughs> are you familiar with the game uh, that's going to be coming out in the next few months called no man's sky i've seen some uh, press about it. it looks pretty uh-huh it's based on the same kind of idea as minecraft was where everything is procedurally generated and there's an algorithm that depending on your location in the galaxy the whole universe is created around you right and so i thought that was pretty interesting as it actually kind of fits in some of people's theories about the simulation hypothesis that, you know, even in physics, when you observe something, its state changes compared to when you don't. That's the same sort of way this uh, video game works. Right. Everything is a seed until you as a player go and observe it. And then it, it generates yeah. based on a certain algorithm. Yeah. So even if our descendants say spend, you know, an hour a day on average in simulations, like that's a pretty big assumption, right? Uh, they really like to be in simulations. They spend an hour a day in simulations. The question is, what fraction of those simulation time are they spent simulating us? <laughs> now, for analogy, I'd say, think about the Roman Empire. Today, many people play video games and many people uh, play act. They do role playing and they are in plays and they even fantasize. If we just added up all the fantasizing and role playing and play acting and video game times, what fraction of all that is spent simulating the Roman Empire? Ordinary people in the Roman Empire. It's right, pretty right. small, and it's honestly probably substantially smaller than the number of actual people there were in the Roman Empire. You know, of course, our descendants will be even larger than us, but uh, will they become fascinated with simulating the Roman Empire or us? I think it's just too easy to assume that we're so fascinating that, of course, the future would be all over us. You know, maybe there's a few people in our society, so maybe, you know, Caesar <laughs> will get <laughs> enough simulations that uh, Caesar should have thought he was in a simulation. But for most random people in the Roman Empire – they should probably believe they were in the Roman Empire because descendants aren't really that interested in simulating them. Huh. But what if they're not pre-programmed simulations? They're just a, a seed and then it goes and does its own thing, like like an M. You know, you, you upload the brain into the computer and then you maybe program it to do certain tasks, such as, you know, think you're living in a biological world and you have to procreate and you have to work. <laughs> and then it just goes and does its own thing based on those parameters. Remember, the emulation world is a subsistence economy, and so the cost of running an emulation is itself a large fraction of any one worker's wages. Now, the cost to emulate any person in history is a similar fraction to the cost of running an emulation. So it just can't be cheap to run an emulation of a full mind, no matter how far in history that was, compared to the cost of running an emulation. Any person is expensive to run. Now, it's easy to have a seed that has the potential of a person, but it's expensive to actually use that seed. So, you know, even in this new video game, it will have this vast galaxy of potential places to visit, but most of them won't actually get visited. Exactly. Most places on most of those planets will never actually be seen. They're all potentially there in the seed, but in fact, because there are only so many people will play the game and for so many hours, only so many actual places will turn out to uh, be real. You know, I wonder, this actually kind of ties into the idea of the Fermi paradox. You know, if the Drake equation is correct and the probability of other intelligent civilizations out there is actually very high, why haven't we encountered any of them? And one of the answers for the Fermi paradox is that we are living in a simulation that in none of the other alien civilizations just have been simulated yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually have a section on that at the end of the book. Uh, there's a section called Aliens because so many people have asked me, what does this book tell us about uh, the Fermi Paradox, or as I've called it, the Great Filter? And I basically have to say it doesn't really tell us much. <laughs> so when you look out in the sky and you're looking for aliens, you wonder why you don't see aliens. You should be looking for things that are really far more advanced than we are. We, we are just at the earliest possible stages of even being the sorts of things you could see. But if we're going to change a lot in our future history, then that's the sort of thing you should look for out there. Now, emulations are different from us, so they certainly give you an idea how different the things you might look for are different from us. But plausibly, after emulations comes something else and then something else after that. The robust thing to say is that 
gee, it sure looks like we could grow and expand and take over the solar system and, and change the sun, and we could just do really big things. Even emulations will be able to do far more than we can, and whatever they turn into next will be even more capable. So the robust thing is to say is our descendants will just have an enormous ability to use matter in various ways and to make use of enormous energy and matter, and whatever you're looking for should be something like that, something that's growing. Now, people have said, well, notice how the emulations really come close to each other into a small number of dense cities, and uh, in virtual reality, they, they don't even pay attention to the physical worlds, and so therefore, couldn't all these aliens be stuck in a bunch of small dense cities where they pay attention to virtual reality and ignore everything else? And I don't think that's very plausible because even if that's what most are doing, the, this emulation economy is growing very fast. Again, plausibly, it's doubling every month, and a, and a big chunk of that growth is just raw physical growth. And on cosmological timescales, that's nothing. So uh, even the growth rate of our economy doubling every 15 years couldn't plausibly last for another you know, million years, even at the rate that farmers were growing by doubling every thousand years. Even that couldn't last a million years. And a million years is a tiny fraction of cosmological time. So the robust thing to be noticing is just how fast total growth has been and how robust it seems to be of, of lasting through many different eras. And so the main thing to say about aliens is unless they really destroy themselves, uh, they should grow fast and grow big. And then the puzzle is, well, then where are they? Because wouldn't something growing big and fast be visible out there? And yeah, that's the problem. Where are they? They don't seem to be there. So what do you think is the most probable solution to the Fermi paradox? They never were there. <laughs> Something very early on in our history was the key filter, uh, the origin of life or the origin of multicellular life or some key step long ago was something that was just very hard and it's hardly ever happened in, in the vast universe. And therefore, that the filter ahead of us isn't so hard. But even if the filter ahead of us is much easier than what's behind us, still it could still be hard enough to kill us. So we should still be really worried about what is ahead in our history that could kill us and trying to do everything we can to avoid that. I'm actually uh, kind of surprised based off of your book and the idea of the emulations that you wouldn't say they didn't grow bigger, they went smaller, they went into their own sort of virtual reality dimensions and never bothered to leave it. Well, any one M gets smaller, but the entire M civilization gets bigger. Virtual reality is built out of physics and real material things. You, you can't be in virtual reality unless you've got real computers running made out of real physical stuff with real energy and real cooling and real real estate and the actual physical real estate the emulation economy uses might start small but again it's growing so fast that a relatively short time scale it'll fill up the earth and then fill up the solar system you might have many trillions quadrillions of emulations enjoying their virtual reality but built out of a solar system full of computers uh, where we disassembled everything else to make those computers so they can enjoy their virtual realities like the cover of your book <laughs> do you have an audiobook planned I'm told uh, one is coming, but uh, usually I don't get that much details. I'm also told a Chinese translation is coming. Oh, cool. All right. Thanks for joining us. This is a lot of fun. Well, it's been great talking to you. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. That's it for that episode. If you want to get access to the show notes, go to futurethinkers.org slash episode 30. If you guys like this episode, we very much appreciate you leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.